So we are in our Nebuchadnezzar series. And last week we got to see firsthand what it is like to be in exile. We heard about the conditions. We heard about what it meant. And we saw last week that there was this pressure that Daniel was facing, this pressure that was that was trying to force him and move him to change his language, change his culture, change his diet, change his name, right? And from the very beginning of this series, I warned you that this book messes with us. It doesn't play by the normal rules. And chapter 2 is no exception. In fact, chapter 2 of Daniel does something almost unlike anywhere else in Scripture. Because all of a sudden, in chapter 2, verse 4, the book changes languages. What? That's odd goes from Hebrew to Aramaic. And there are a few places in Scripture where you'll see some Aramaic being used. Most of the time it's quotes that they're using it for. But this book, what it does in this chapter, is unlike anywhere else. See, it would be like if you picked up your favorite novel and you started reading and and you get through chapter 1. Perfect. It's making sense. And all of a sudden, partway through chapter 2, it changed to Spanish. And the whole rest of the book, the rest of the chapters that you start turning through, what is happening, they're in Spanish. And then at the very end of the book, it turns back to English. What is happening here? It's done with intention, but it's not playing by the rules. See, what's happening is this book talked about how Daniel was forced in exile to change his language Daniel had to change his language from Hebrew to Aramaic, the language of Babylon. And did you see what the book just did to us? The book just forced you to change your language. Welcome to exile. This book wants us to build that pressure around us. It wants us to feel the pressure of exile, to feel as our situation is being forced to change as our language is being forced to change right out from underneath us. And in this chapter 2, it's not a, a pretty picture at the end of it because we have only begun to enter exile. It's only starting to mess with us. It's uphill from here. There's no light at the tunnel, end of the tunnel yet. Spoiler alert. Chapter 2, it ends and goes into chapter 3. And this feeling of exile, this pressure that you have on your shoulders, it will only get heavier. Oh no. So we've set the tone for the chapter already. We know the setting, the taste of this chapter, the feel of exile. And we feel that pressure of Babylon pushing in on us, forcing us to change. Perfect. That's the first step in understanding chapter 2 and what it's doing. Now we know the setting. Step two is to look at the actual story. Now three core elements of this story in chapter two, and there are three parts, three sections essentially of the story for us to wrestle with this morning. And in this first core element of the story, part one, we'll see an impossible task meets the Almighty God. An impossible task meets the Almighty God. This is the first core element of the story. We have the setting. And just a quick recap of of what we just heard in this first section of the scripture. Essentially, Nebuchadnezzar wakes up in cold sweats, right? He can't sleep. He had a wild dream and he's sure that God is speaking to him. But, Nebuchadnezzar is not quite sure what the dream is saying. So he brings in all of his psychics, fortune tellers, magicians, all these different characters, but he's suspicious. He's not quite sure that they're actually as legitimate as they claim. So he poses this test, and it goes sort of like this. You say your God has given you special powers? Surely your God can give you the power to know what my dream is. He gave me the dream after all. 
I want to know the dream and its interpretation. And this sounds like a ridiculous request, right? Who can actually do something like that? Impossible. But apparently, when you are the most powerful person on the planet, you can make ridiculous requests, right? Classic Nebuchadnezzar move right here. Because remember, Nebuchadnezzar is the bad guy. He's the antagonist, the enemy. So Nebuchadnezzar makes this claim. He says, if, if you don't do it, I'll kill you and your family. Ooh, bad guy. Now there is a key verse in this first part of the chapter. It's how these fortune tellers, these psychics, these magicians respond to the king's request, what they say back to him that just got read to us. It happens in verse 10. The astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. No one can reveal it to the king except for the gods themselves, and they do not dwell among the people. That's the language that's being used there. And from a pagan perspective, this is totally correct, right? The gods are way out there. They're distant. They're not here and, and knowable on a personal level. The gods don't really actually care about individuals. They only care about what you can do for them, right? Give them a sacrifice and maybe you can buy their favor. These pagan gods are almost like cosmic vending machines. And I remember as a kid, I don't know why, but I loved vending machines. In fact, there was a vending machine at our local pool that we would go to. And every time I went to the pool, my mom would always give me a dollar to go spend on the vending machine after we went swimming. It was the highlight. It was probably the part I liked most about going to the pool, ironically. And it was the best thing ever. You could put in your dollar and then punch a number and the machine spits out whatever you want, right? But there was a problem with this particular vending machine at the pool. It was a bit quirky. I think there was too many wet chlorine covered hands that had been mashing on the buttons, right? It had some problems. And every so often, you would walk up and you'd, you'd want a Snickers B4 you press the numbers, and on the little screen, it would pop up C4, right? And all of a sudden, you know what's in C4. It is the unpopped microwave popcorn. And it would come tumbling out. And as a kid, it was terrible. You'd look around, and there's not a microwave. What are you going to do with this popcorn? Why is this even in here, right? Disappointment. And you know that vending machine guy, when he comes to restock the the machine, I am sure of it. He probably goes in there, looks around and says, I don't know why these kids keep buying popcorn, right? <laughs> oh well, keep putting it in there. They love it. It's traumatizing. We put in one thing and then don't get it and we get something else that we didn't want. And I remember this one time vividly. It was sort of traumatizing as a young kid. I watched my little dollar go into the machine and then nothing popped up on the screen. It ate my dollar. And when your highlight of going to the pool is the vending machine afterwards, I was, it was catastrophic. I started crying in front of all my friends. I was young, remember? This is traumatizing experience, right? The pagan gods are like that quirky vending machine. Sometimes you get what you want. Sometimes you don't get what you want. And sometimes they just eat your dollar. Imagine how disappointed Nebuchadnezzar must be right now. He's the most powerful man on the planet. He's been collecting magicians, enchanters, and astrologers from every corner of the planet. These are the brightest and the best. These are the people from every background, coming from every religion, representing every known deity. And all these magicians, enchanters, and astrologers turn 
to their cosmic vending machine. They look through the rows. Okay, B9, dream interpretation, but there's nothing here. There is no dream revelation on command. They turn to Nebuchadnezzar and say, we can't do that. It's not in the machine. What you just asked is impossible. It's not for sale. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods themselves. And they do not dwell among people. See, the pagans are totally right when they say only a divine being can do what Nebuchadnezzar is asking. But they're also totally wrong because there is a God that dwells among people. And there is a God who can do what Nebuchadnezzar is asking. But the tension that we're facing is that this God is not like the pagan gods. He's not a vending machine, as we'll see. So let's continue in on our passage, starting and picking up in verse 17 of Daniel chapter 2. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from God, from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He disposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. So the second part of our story, the second essential element, is that a powerful prayer reminds us that God is in control. A powerful prayer reminds us that God is in control. And part of the reason I liked those vending machines, why I had such a fascination with them, is because I could pick whatever I wanted. Twix, Snickers, the world was at my fingertips, right? My destiny was my own. Now Daniel prays this prayer, and it is absolutely clear to us. God changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. Daniel's fate is not in his own hands. Daniel's fate is in God's hands. God is in control and and has a plan. Main theme, right? And just reading these words, it's not something we always recognize. But think about how scary that idea is. Imagine being Daniel in exile. Everything is on the line. You could lose it all, including your life. What if Daniel asks God to reveal Nebuchadnezzar's dream and God says no? He shuts the door, just like we've seen him do in chapter 1. It's out of Daniel's control. This is actually kind of scary. See, that's why we're more comfortable with a cosmic vending machine. At least we can mash the buttons and sometimes it works and we can pick what we want or try to. But Daniel makes it clear from this powerful prayer, God is in control, yikes, and that means I'm not in control, and I don't really like that very much. See, the next few things that happen in this story is that we actually hear about this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And it might seem a little bit odd, but we're not actually spending a lot of time on the dream. I'm not even going to read it out loud. What? What's happening? I thought this whole chapter was about the dream. Well, the dream and its interpretation are written in the chapter. They are valuable. I would encourage you to go through and and reread them this week. Check them out. See what they say. 
but I'm purposefully not going to read them because I don't want us to focus on the dream itself because the dream is not what the meaning of this chapter is, the purpose of this chapter. I don't want us to lose sight of the big picture because the significance of the dream itself is to reinforce for us the same idea that's being represented in this prayer. For us, the reader, to know that God is in control and has a plan. Same purpose as the prayer. And this seems a bit weird because most of the time, especially if you hear sermons about Daniel chapter 2, it seems like the whole focus is on the dream itself, right? What does it mean? Was it the Romans? Was it the Greeks? How do we interpret this dream? This may seem odd to you that we're not focusing on the dream. So let me give you a second opinion other than myself, right? Maybe it'll help put you at ease that we're not focusing on the dream itself. So a famous Old Testament scholar, his name is Dr. Tremper Longman from Westmont College. And this is a major heavy hitter of the Old Testament. I would go to bet that probably a majority of the people out here in the audience right now, as you look down at your Bible and look at the book of Daniel, he probably translated your translation. Heavy hitter. He gives this second opinion for us of what the meaning of this dream is in his commentary on Daniel. He says the following, the core concern was not the content of the dream or even its interpretation, but on Daniel's God-given ability to interpret the dream. That's the point. He goes on and says, in other words, it is not the content of the revelation of future that is primary, what is most important here is the fact that it is only Daniel's God that knows the future. And God's knowledge of the future is particularly important to people in exile and under some measure of oppression because it implies that he controls history. See, this book, this chapter, is not about revealing the dream to us. It's about revealing who God is. And he uses a dream. The dream is interesting, but don't miss the meaning because it's meaning we see in the prayer itself. God is in control. Now, the last part of this chapter does something unexpected. So let's read it. Picking up in Daniel, verse 45, the second half of it. The second half of verse 45. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Daniel gives Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation. And then verse 46, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and offered him and, and ordered that an offering of incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. So the third part of this story, this ending portion, is an incredible witness to an enemy. Don't forget who Nebuchadnezzar is. All these moving pieces of this chapter, lots of words, it's easy to miss. But we are in exile. We are wondering, what is going on? Why are we here? God, where are we going? God, why are you giving dreams to the antagonist, the bad guy, Nebuchadnezzar? See, this whole dream thing that God has, it puts us, his good guys, his, his heroes, this dream puts us in danger. What are you doing? What are you doing, God? Not cool. But recognize that so far, God's plan has been unfolding. And what exactly has it been revealing? God's plan just led the most powerful pagan on the planet, an enemy, to bow down prostrate and say, Daniel, your God is not like any other. Daniel, your God can do something that none of the other gods can do. 
No other God on this planet can do that. Whoa. Now that is powerful. God puts us directly in danger, giving Nebuchadnezzar that dream, right? But he seems to have a plan. Now to be clear, this is not a conversion experience for Nebuchadnezzar. You don't have to go very far into chapter 3 to realize that. He is still pagan as they come. He is still running on the vending machine model of God, right? And so this end of chapter 2, what it really is, is less conversion experience and more about God essentially putting a dollar back into the machine that just dispensed his candy. Nebuchadnezzar will remove any doubt of that in this next chapter that comes after this one. But this was an incredible witness. How much control God has. He just had the man who destroyed his temple fall to his knees. See, we started with the setting. Now we've seen the three essential elements of this story and what it's revealing to us through this chapter. Now it's time to ask, what does this chapter mean in my life? What does it mean in my life? Us, each one of us individually. And it's an important question because this chapter was not written simply for us to know a historical event, right? This whole event could have been summarized in like four sentences. And why does it do it the way that it does? Using the tools and the, the style that it's using. It uses a historical event to help us encounter Daniel's God. For us to have a witness as well. See, this sermon is named Danger, and Danger is aptly what Daniel is facing. But Daniel seems to have this calmness to him through this chapter. We don't see him panicking quite like those other astrologers were. He doesn't have the interpretation, and the astrologers don't either. The astrologers say, oh no, impossible. No God can do that. Daniel responds and says, give me a day. Give me a little time. What causes Daniel to have that kind of confidence, that kind of peace in the midst of danger? See, the magicians were perplexed, faced with an impossible task, and it causes them to be in despair. But Daniel is facing that same perplexed, that same impossible task. But Daniel is not in despair. His life is on the line and he says, give me a day. That sort of peace comes only from the Almighty God. A God that can do the impossible. But here's where the rubber meets the road. If you were in Daniel's shoes, wouldn't you be a bit scared? I mean, seriously, why is Daniel so calm? Why is he not in complete despair? He doesn't know what's going to be happening next right? Because let's be honest, it is the Almighty God. But what if God, he asks God to reveal Nebuchadnezzar's dream and God says no? What if he asks and God shuts the door? He shuts the door on Daniel once before already. Each of us is left with that difficult question. We want the peace and the calmness that Daniel has. But is Daniel just being ignorant? Is he not recognizing? He doesn't know what's going to be happening. He doesn't know the plan. We want that peace. But where does it come from and how do we get it? If we're struggling with it, chances are we're running on the wrong model of who God is. Our concern is essentially with this whole question. What if I trust God? I put the dollar in the machine and the candy doesn't come out, right? This chapter is trying to reveal to us why Daniel's God is not like the pagan gods. This God isn't a cosmic vending machine. He's personal. He dwells with us and he has a plan. 
So let me give you an illustration that will help capture what makes Daniel's God so unique. What this God that dwells with us, why that changes the whole model. So I have a very good friend. We grew up together. We were in, we were babies together, side by side. And all through school, we, we had each other's backs, best friends for years and years and years, our whole life. We've shared countless stories together, and I trust this friend. So much, though, that if my life was on the line, I know he would come through for me. I would, I would have this calmness almost, knowing that it doesn't matter if his car breaks down on the way here. I'll look over there and see him walking on the horizon, right? He's not going to let me down. I trust him. And if, you know, this is something that's never been said, but sometimes you have that friend and you know you know, if someone pointed a gun at me, he would jump in front and take the bullet. Never been said. But you know. You know that person. I know him, and I know that's what he'd do. If my life was in that friend's hands, I could have confidence. Not because I know what he's going to be doing. Not because I know his exact plan. My confidence comes from who he is. My confidence co comes because I know who he is. Our God is different than a cosmic vending machine. God dwells with us. You can know him like I know that friend. Daniel is at peace because he knows exactly who God is. He knows that God is the God who can do anything, right? We heard it over and over. It almost, it almost bothered us how many times this chapter repeats it. God is in control and he has a plan, right? For some reason, that's not as comforting as we were hoping. But why is it different for Daniel? He knows that and he knows who this God is. He knows him personally, like I know my friend. He knows this God and, and knows his personality. Daniel stands there and you can just imagine him thinking, man, this is the God I think that would jump in front of a bullet for me. You know what? It's under control. I know he'll come through. I don't know what he'll do. I don't know the plan but he's the guy who will come through for me. That's the relationship that Daniel has with God. And that's the relationship. That's the thing we desire, right? That peace that he has, but it doesn't come from a vending machine. The vending machines will always make us a little bit anxious. We're never quite sure if we'll press the wrong button or if the thing will short out or if it'll just eat our dollar. It needs to be personal. This is the faith that Daniel has. So what do we need to build a relationship like that? See, I was contemplating writing some notes down on the bottom of your, your sermon outline for you. A little how-to, a formula on how to do that, right? And then I realized that relationships are not formulas. And so I wrote nothing. Instead, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. When it comes to relationships with other people, those relationships with those people that we know, we trust, those people that it's never been said, but we know they'll jump in front of that bullet for us. How did we get those relationships? How did we foster those relationships? How did those relationships form? What is it that you needed? As you think about that question, maybe for some of you, the thing that comes to mind is you think, I needed to spend a lot of time with that person before that kind of relationship formed. Bingo. Spending time with them. 
Or maybe some of you thought, you know, I really need some experiences with that person. That's how I build that relationship. We need to work on a project together, or go on a vacation together, or spend time in an experience together. Yeah, that might be you. For others, it might be, I really need to talk with that person. I need to spend a lot of time talking and, and communicating with them before that relationship is ever possible. What I want you to do is on the bottom of your sermon outline, write down, maybe it takes a couple sentences, maybe it's short, but what is it that you need to foster a relationship like that? Are you a person that needs maybe conversation? You need an experience. You need time spent together. What is it? Take a second, write it down on the bottom of that page. That's the thing you need to seek with God. We always say things like read scripture or, or spend time in prayer or serve. The purpose of those things are not to put dollars in the machine. It's to build a relationship. And that is what we're seeking. On the bottom of your page, you know what it is that you need to be longing with, to be moving after, to build that relationship with God. It's not a formula. But that gives you a first step in building that kind of faith that Daniel has. You will never have Daniel's peace if God remains a cosmic vending machine. You'll be like me that crazy traumatized kid crying when it ate your dollar, right? Or yelling at the machine because it didn't give you the treat you wanted. Vending machines are inconsistent. There's no peace to be had when everything's on the line. In the midst of exile and danger, without knowing where this path is leading, we look at it and see it's winding and twisting. Exile, danger, where are we going? Daniel is perplexed, but not in despair, because he has a real relationship with this God. And we keep hearing God is in control like a broken record. But that means something entirely different when you know this God. Like I know that friend. Our peace in the midst of danger, being perplexed but not in despair, comes from that real relationship, the God who dwells with us. How can we foster that real relationship with God this week? You've got it written down on your notes in front of you. Let's pray and close our service together. Father, we thank you that you are not like anything else. Nebuchadnezzar would have been familiar with every single possible background, tribe, religion. He'd conquered the known world. And yet, he's troubled. The most powerful man on the planet is troubled. Because he doesn't quite know you. Father, there is, there is not a vending machine that will give us that comfort. There's not power in our own hands taking it into our own matters that will give us that comfort. Father, we find that peace in the midst of danger, in the midst of exile, and it comes through you, knowing you, knowing that, that you're the God who comes through. We might not know how. We might not know the plan but we know who you are. And you are the kind of God that would step in front of the bullet for us. So Father, help us build that in us. Help us to seek that relationship. Let the things we do this week not be things that feed the machine, but things that bring us closer to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.